everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Tonight you're going to hear about the progress being made in our town, in our schools, and in our house of worship. And I think uh, you are going to be very, very happy with that. We are going to applaud the student winners of the art contest, which is a sculptor of uh, salvage art, and it's up here. We are also going to uh, applaud the two students who have just joined our task force and are members of the Youth Council. They have done a tremendous amount of work, and we are very happy to have them here and reward them. Our two letters that have been created by our, by our environmental expert, Catherine Nguyen, have to do with recycling alkaline al um, batteries and also getting rid of these. Who wants these? <laughs> um, what we're asking for is, if you don't want them, a way to opt out, and if you do want them, a better way to distribute. Also, you'll see all of the, the books, materials, door prizes, and uh, sustainability products. I, if any of you have brought in sneakers, we are recycling them through Got Sneakers. Now, one thing I really want you to do is, on your way out, take a page with a list of all the videos and products that the East Brunswick Library has that you can borrow. And uh, the mayor is going to appear in a little while, but we're going to start with the panel. And it's my, uh, my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Nancy Chronic, and our, um, our mayor, when he comes in, I want you to know he is a, also a doctor. He's an MD of OBGYN. So he is not only mayor, but he is a doctor, Dr. Brad Cohen. The principal planner of Middlesex County is with us tonight, and she's going to be able to tell us a lot about recycling. She is in the department of public safety, health, solid waste management. And her name is Carol Tomashevitz. We have an engineer with us. Uh, our engineer is a ruling elder and chair of the property committee at Trinity Presbyterian Church. And this is Dr. Rich Zielinski. Next is our East, Bru East Brunswick High School students, who are the co-authors of the book, The Essential Guide to Understanding Sustainability. And they are Devik and, De and Sharink pa uh, Pastel. Dr. Victor Velasky is unable to be here tonight, but in his place, we have Matthew Goldstein, who is a teacher of science and environmental science at the East Brunswick Public High School. Our Rutgers researcher is in transit. I hope he'll be able uh, to get here tonight. He's here. Where? Where? Oh, hi. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see you coming in. This is Roger Wang. He has been doing very innovative research on climate change at Rutgers University. So we are delighted to have you, Roger. OK, um, I think we may have time, uh, Nancy, for you to start the program. OK. Right. So welcome again, and happy Earth Day. It's a little late, but I'm delighted to be joining you in East Brunswick to celebrate Earth Day and celebrate another year of your accomplishments. Um, what we're looking to do tonight is to increase our understanding of sustainability, which you are very advanced for a community, in my experience working with you, um, and, and um, un get a sense, uh, identify what progress you've made in the schools, in your township, um, and in other parts of the community relative to climate solutions. Um, we're going to do a call to action. 
uh, for initiatives in East Brunswick uh, to get not just the town, but industry and government to get more involved. Um, focus on specifically what we're doing locally. So what's happening here in East Brunswick, not just the, the global problems with sustainability, but how you are not only dealing with it, but how we can all celebrate all the advances you've made and the progress um, since last year when we had another program on this topic. So just quickly, the ground rules for tonight. Um, not that I have to uh, uh, repeat them, but I will anyway. So everyone is encouraged to participate and listen to one another. We will have time for your questions um, after we have short presentations from the panel. And it's really a discussion that we want to encourage here. Um, we hope you'll keep an open mind uh, help ensure respectable, a respectful space for all, um, maintain an atmosphere for discussion, and say that it's fine to disagree, but not to be disagreeable. So um, please just keep an open mind. So with that, we're going to start the panel. Um, who do we have first? Is it? I think it was going to be the mayor. So we'll start with Carol. OK, Carol, take it away. Thanks. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Carol Tomashevich. Again, I work for the Middlesex County Department of Safe, Public Safety and Health and the Division of Solid Waste Management. I wanted to uh, first start off by thanking East Brunswick for being a great partner to our county and to our division. Um, East Brunswick, if you don't know, hosts a few of our solid waste and recycling programs. Uh, namely the tire recycling program, paint recycling program, and cooking oil recycling program. So we do really appreciate um, all of the efforts of your recycling coordinator, Mark Coleman, and the public works staff in assisting us with our programs. What I wanted to do quickly was frame the solid waste um, and recycling programs that we do in the county and things that uh, a couple of focus areas that we're going to be working towards. So uh, first I wanted to uh, mention that we uh, operate under what's what we call the waste management hierarchy. So it's a list of measures from most preferred to least preferred on handling our solid waste and our recycling. So first and foremost, uh, source reduction, waste reduction, if we can reduce the amount of waste we uh, generate in the first place, then we don't have to recycle as much. Uh, reuse, uh, then recycling and composting, and finally landfilling. Uh, just to let you know about what we generate, um, this graph, and it's a little bit busy because we have a lot of years in there, but if you, you look at kind of the overall um, aspect of it, uh, the gray color represents solid waste and the kind of the light green color represents recycling. So way back in 1987, we were uh, disposing of far more of our solid waste than we were recycling. And then, um, you know, when we come to 2020, we are recycling a lot more. Our recycling rate in our county is a little over 60% of the total waste. Uh, we end up disposing of about 860,000 tons of waste each year, uh, most of which, which goes to the Middlesex County landfill off Route 18 in East Brunswick. Um, and we recycle 1.8 million tons of, of materials each year. So that, that's great numbers. Um, room for improvement. There's always room for improvement. But uh, you know, I do want to appreciate everything that our residents and our businesses are doing. When we look at areas to focus on, one of the things we look at is, is, what is uh, what's the waste stream composition? What comprises the majority of our waste? Um, so you'll see from the chart, and this is a national chart from, the, from EPA, um, paper and paperboard. Uh, predominant, um, you know, almost 25% of our waste stream is paper and paperboard. Uh, and we are recycling it. Um, again, some room for improvement. We're probably not recycling everything we can recycle, but we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, look at the next big block. Next big block is food waste. We're not doing such a good job on food waste, and that's going to be one of our focus areas. Okay, and this is the slide I'm gonna mostly focus on uh, because it is our programs that we are working on now. Uh, first, Recycle Right. Uh, many of you may have heard in the news, uh, recycling markets went down. Uh, you know, there are no recycling markets. Nobody wants our recyclables. There was an issue a few years ago 
A lot of our recyclables were being shipped overseas. Um, those overseas markets uh, began to reject our material. Uh, why did they reject our material? Because we were sending them garbage. Uh, we weren't sending them recyclables that they could take and make into new products. We were sending them garbage. So the county and the rest of the state of New Jersey started focusing on a recycling message. Recycle right is what we call our message. It's uh, teaching residents and businesses what we should and should not be recycling. Uh, biggest uh, issues over the last few years, plastic bags, people putting their recyclables in plastic bags and leaving them out at the curb. Uh, people recycling everything plastic. We only want your bottles, jars, and jugs. We don't want your um, children's toys. We don't want garden hoses. Um, there's a lot of things that people try to recycle that they really shouldn't be. So that's one big focus area, and we're going to continue focusing on that over the next couple of years. Uh, second one, as I mentioned early, waste reduction. Source reduction, waste reduction, that's the first thing we should be doing. Uh, we kind of fell away from that for a few years. We're, we're bringing that idea back. What we're trying to do is give people ideas on how you can reduce your waste. So things like bringing your shopping bags to the store. Well, you have to now anyway, so now we're, we're finding that people are, are, are getting a little bit more used to that. Bringing a reusable water bottle, bringing a reusable mug, uh, bringing utensils, uh, rejecting utensils if you're getting takeout and just bringing your takeout home. You don't need plastic utensils. You can just say, I don't need plastic utensils. And, and think of all the little things that we can all do that are going to add up um, to reduce the amount of solid waste we're generating. Third big one is food waste reduction. Uh, food waste, you know, 21 to 22 percent of our municipal solid waste stream. Uh, we've done statistics. Every resident in Middlesex County throws away five, an average of 500 pounds of food waste each year. That's crazy. That is a crazy amount of food waste. Uh, we began partnering with Replenish. Replenish is the Middlesex County food uh, bank that's out in East Brunswick. Um, and we are partnering on a food reduction uh, message. So uh, the food reduction message is learn what you can do to reduce your food waste. So learn about food labels. What does a label mean? Does the label mean I have to throw this food out if, if it's past the date by one day? No. So we're trying to teach people, reteach people about food labels and when it, you know, what to do if you're past the due date, what you can do to make sure you're eating uh, food that's still safe without throwing it away unnecessarily. Inventory. Inventory your refrigerator before you go food shopping. Meal plan. Look in your refrigerator. What do I have? Uh, we just harvested a bunch of asparagus, so this week was asparagus week for, for us in, in my house. Look at what you have. Plan a meal for the week before you go food shopping so you know what you're buying and you don't buy things that you're going to end up throwing away. Don't bulk buy if you're not going to eat it. Uh, my house doesn't eat a lot of cereal, so me buying a huge box of cereal means that I'm going to throw away half the box because it'll be stale by the time we get to it. So think about issues like that. Uh, learn how to store your food properly. Uh, if you're not going to get to it, you know, what's the best way to freeze it? What's the best way, uh, what's the best containers to put it in? Um, and then second, uh, reuse your food, meaning have leftover nights, have share tables at the office. Um, and donate your unused food that you're not going to eat because maybe you decided you didn't like it uh, to food pantries because they can use, uh, they can use your, your materials. And uh, finally with food, uh, recycling. And recycling is an emerging, an emerging field with food waste uh, where there's not a lot of facilities in New Jersey yet. Um, so that is something that's going to be coming over the next couple of years. We hope to have some, some opportunities for us to recycle our food waste. But if we can reduce and reuse the food that we have now, we're going to have less that we have to recycle later on. And the last issue I wanted to talk about was avoid the spark. This is also a, a new issue. Um, avoid the spark really um, is talk, t trying to teach residents that um, we need to be careful with our rechargeable batteries, especially our lithium ion rechargeable batteries, which can be found in laptops, cell phones, uh, many toys, uh, many um, electronic devices, you know, anything rechargeable may be a lithium ion battery. We have to make sure that we're recycling those properly and not putting them in our curbside recycling bin, not putting them in our garbage, 
but bringing them to a location that can, make, that can ensure that that's going to get recycled properly. Uh, the problem that we're having, and you may have read this in the news, um, is these batteries cause these huge fires that are really difficult to, to put out. And New York City's had problems with e-bike batteries, which are a lithium ion battery. And they've had fires that have unfortunately uh, resulted in fatalities. So we're trying to educate residents that lithium ion batteries and other rechargeable batteries really need to be handled properly. So that was my quick synopsis, and I probably took too much time, so I apologize. But that's the quick synopsis of what we're working on, and you know, we'll, we'll need everybody's help uh, to get there. So next is Rich. Rich. Mm -hmm. Thanks for having me here today. Um, my name is Rich Linsky, and I'm from Trinity Presbyterian Church right here in East Brunswick. And I'm going to tell a little story about our environmental journey and about what caused us to take this journey. And it's a journey that 15 years later, we're still on. So back in 2008, in a typical Presbyterian style, we convened a meeting to say how to choose what to work on. What do we want to covenant with? What do we want to do as part of a larger church mission? And we were looking at the environment, homelessness, food insecurity, and items along this line. And along the line that, that we made an argument was made that if we don't get the environment correct, the work on all the other stuff isn't going to matter. So the environment was like an overriding issue that sort of like played a hand in all those other areas. And so that's why we decided to start some work on the environment. And how do you start? You form a committee to study the issue. So, uh, and one thing that we decided to do early on was that we couldn't really preach on the environment, we couldn't really teach on the environment until we started to get our own house in order. So we wanted to be the change that you want to see in the world. And it's uh, attributed to Gandhi, but I think it's appropriate here in terms of our work and our governing principle of our work. And so we focused inwardly. We focused on our, our practices and, our, and things that we were doing inside the building. And so uh, we used information and help from an organization that was also uh, just getting started at the time, Green Faith. They were partnering with Houses of Worship in the Middlesex County area at the time. And they formed a roadmap that we could follow as we began our green journey. So I was really proud of, the, of my church community that this wasn't just the work of the committee. This was the work of the entire church structure. The, the entire church embraced all the changes that we needed to do. And we needed that effort in order to be successful. And so we focused on two things. We focused on changing church behavior and also education and educating our fellow members. And that picture there to the right are some of the green coffee cups that we made to replace the paper ones that they replaced. So we now all use reusable coffee cups. So one of the big programs that we had um, that I think might be appropriate that people might not be aware of because we're all part of probably some nonprofit organizations or other churches is this PSENG Energy Savers Program. And this is a program where if you look on your uh, utility bill, it's funded by the societal benefits charge on your utility bill. And it's a program specifically for nonprofits and government agencies in your state. And it's funded by, again, that societal benefits charge on your bill. So what happens as part of the program is that it's under no obligation to start as that psc &G comes and does an audit of your facility. And then they come in and recommend it changes, and they offer to pay for in our case, in our year, 70% of the bill. And that's typically what they do. They pay for that outright. No strings attached. You just have to do everything that's on their list. The remaining 30% is funded by the organization, and it's funded as an, as an interest-free loan. So psc &G comes in with their contractors, does the work. That's a requirement of the program. And there's no money immediately out of pocket to the organization. You pay that back over a period of years. So we had to pay just over $50,000 for our share, and we got a lot of stuff. So we got two brand new boilers uh, replacing equipment that was inefficient from 1963 and 1972. 
We had LED lighting installed throughout the facility. And we got, even got new air conditioning units for our sanctuary to replace the ones that were at that time about 16 years old from 2002. So what are some of these new behaviors that we had? And again, we are not perfect, right? Again, this isn't a journey. So you shouldn't kick yourself, right? It's, it's, it's change, it's, it's a small step down the line. You don't really realize that you're going on this difficult road. So we refrain from the use of paper plates, coffee mugs, and, and, and non-reusable glasses. So, so we reuse, uh, so, so we have in our coffee hour and our dinners, we actually use real plates. Uh, we even used uh, cloth napkins for a period of time too, and people would take them home and, and, and launder them. So we reuse items, we repurpose items. So as a nonprofit and as a church, we take items that we're not using and maybe they can be used by another church or another family. And so we try to find a home for that other item so that they can get more use out of it before we actually throw it away. We do recycle as a church. We have programmable thermostats throughout our facility. We do church dinners, frequently feature a vegetarian offering. We have a congregational garden for people to garden on site, a butterfly garden for the wildlife. We have about two acres of unused property and we converted that some into a wildlife habitat, which is recognized by the World Wildlife Fund. We use green cleaners. We reduce the number of bulletins published, so we use less paper. Electronic distribution emotes church communication and uh, the communion by intention to eliminate plastic cups. And we share our building. Churches are inefficient in that we have this large space that's only used on you know, days of worship usually. And we try and share our building with other organizations that come in and use our space to make more efficient use of, of the building. In closing, I'd like to read this quote here, uh, which I think sums up this entire you know, sustainability effort. And how do we begin to know the earth and so regain that reverence for life that leads to change? The first step in this process is to recognize that we are an integral part of all that is not superior beings for whom everything else is to be used. We are woven into the web of the universe, and nothing we do is without significance to the rest. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Rich. And we, have, we can now welcome Mayor Brad Cohen, and you can share with us your Remarks? Oh, okay. I'm sorry I'm late, uh, but I uh, appreciate everybody being here today. And this is a, 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 a appreciation for all of those who are here today and those that are sponsoring the, the, the program. Chris, uh, this is the second year in a row, so congratulations. That means that the pressure's on to make sure that you keep doing this. Um, <laughs> but I, I think before we even get started, one of the things that uh, sometimes I lose uh, a sense in my own generation being surrounded by a lot of people um, that don't often see young folks like we have here at the, at the dais and in the audience is that sustainability efforts and, and our planet and preserving um, the earth for the next generation and generations to come is actually the number one issue among young people. And we should not forget the power of young people. Almost every social change that has ever taken place in this country or the world, for that matter, has almost always been empowered and supported and often started by young people, whether that is civil rights movement, women's movements, gay rights movements. They've all been something that was started, supported, and then everybody else seemed to follow. Um, so I think we need to take and pay a lot of attention to our young people because clearly this is a very important issue to them and they're right. And so I think it's important that we recognize that, thank them for their efforts and support them. And in terms of trying to support them, uh, there's a couple of things today that you're gonna be asked to help support. I'm hoping that you will do that. One of those is to reduce plastic cutlery and condiments and takeout uh, um, restaurants. It's simply, if you're not using it, it's completely wasteful, ends up in the landfill and 
what, half-life of about a thousand years? Is that what we want people a thousand years from now who are trying to figure out what our society was about to think about us? Um, unwanted and unused circulars that get thrown on your driveway. I run around from, from house to house and simply see this thing matted down from, from car dri driven over it a million times and no one's ever read it. If you don't want it, there's ways of getting rid of it or asking people not to send it to you to begin with. And if they don't comply, that's what the letter writing campaign is going to be about here, to make sure that we don't deliberately add to the waste that we don't need. And we have a continuing effort to reduce the use of plastic water bottles, which again, is that what we want people a thousand years to think about us, that we had to bottle a natural resource? Silly. Also wanted to recognize that we here in the township um, house the landfill for all of Middlesex County. That's right here in East Brunswick. The township actually gets benefits from that. We get about $4 million a year in host community benefits for having the landfill here. The landfill sits at about 180 feet right now, and when it reaches 240, it's obligated to be capped. That rate at which we reach the 240 is all in your hands, because if we keep adding to it, we'll get there a lot faster. Um, the income source stops to the township, which is important to us as well. But more importantly to the earth, we're just throwing out garbage that for no purpose. We need to reuse, learn how to, to, to recycle. We have a garbage contract that actually ends this year. We run five-year cycles for our garbage contracts here in the township. And the last two times that we went out to bid, um, which is a process we're required to do by law, there was a uh, grand total of one company that bid on it each time. So what bargaining position does the town have when the only person, uh, only one person responded to that bid? So if anything, we're hearing what's going on in other towns right now. There, with the cost of refuse and the cost of recycling going up dramatically, most towns have reported 30 to 40 percent increases in the cost of, of throwing of, of both refuse and recycling. That's, that is a budget killer. We already spend about five to six million dollars a year on refuse. Do you have any idea what a 30% increase would do to taxes here in the town just from that one item alone? So we need to, we will be looking at re-engineering our contract, try to encourage people to do the things that they should be doing anyway, which is to try to recycle, to try to reuse and repurpose items so that we don't throw them away, so that on top of it being the right thing to do, it will save us money. So this is important. And we've accomplished a lot so far as a township. We are one of the first towns to have put in place requirements for electric charging stations before the governor and the state mandated it. We were right on the verge of having a plastic bag ban put in town before the governor ended up doing it. And by law, you can't have a law that's more restrictive than the one that's put in by the state. Our stormwater regulations in this township have always been strict. It was strict before the state required it. And we're working like we started last year with the idea of trying to reduce plastic bottle use. There's now uh, refill uh, uh, um, areas uh, for water and in, in each of the public buildings in the, in the township so that people don't have to rely on single use water bottles that pollute the earth. So I think what we're trying to say is that we are, we're trying to stay ahead of the game. We're trying to do the right thing. We've got a long way to go, but we all have to do this together, and we need to listen to our youth because they're on the right page with this, and I think that if we do that, we will be doing a tremendous service. I live by a credo that my religion believes in, which is uh, tikkun olam. Tikkun olam in Hebrew gets translated to, to repair the world. Our moral imperative is to provide for our children a world that was infinitely better than the way in which we found it. And that if each generation can do that, we would be in a great place. So thank you for believing in what I believe in and making sure that we provide for our children a better world than the way in which we found it. 
Thank you, Mayor Cohn. So we're gonna switch now and talk about what youth are doing. So let's start with our science teacher, Matt, and tell you a little bit about it, and then we will hear from some students in the schools and what they're doing. Sure. Thanks. So, hello, my name is Matt Goldstein. Um, I'm here in lieu of Dr. Valeski. Um, he, unfortunately, wouldn't, uh, wasn't able to make it tonight, uh, but I can still talk about some of the sustainable practices that are being enacted in East Brunswick High School. Um, so, in general, school systems tend to have difficulty with waste management, uh, especially in places like the cafeteria. Um, a lot of food waste, a lot of um, lunches that aren't even touched, food that isn't even opened being thrown away. Um, however, East Brunswick schools have managed to uh, mitigate a lot of these issues. Um, I am an environmental science teacher and also an alumni, so suffice to say, I have seen the effect that these policies have had firsthand. Um, some aspects that I wanted to make note of include the use of fiber lunch trays, which are uh, biodegradable. Um, all of the cups used for water being made of paper. And in my opinion, the most important change was the use of what we call share tables. So this is where students um, place uneaten food, uh, they place it in a basket, and then other students are free to take that food and eat it for themselves, which has reduced the amount of student food waste. Um, so that's been a major success, um, that in particular. So personally, I'm very pleased to see what the high school's been doing in terms of sustainable practices, and I'm looking forward to seeing more of that in the future. Thank you. Great. Thank you for being so concise as well. So we now have two students that are going to tell us about their work. David, D Davik, and Shrenik. Do I have your names right? Yes. Okay. Take it away. Good evening, everyone. Uh, our names are David and Shrenik Patel, and we are co-authors of the Essential Guide to Understanding Sustainability, along with Ms. Catherine Nguyen, who is actually in the back right now. Uh, this handbook is critical because it outlines the current environmental problems and sustainable solutions and habits people can build to help relieve Earth of these problems. It's also practical because it defines key terms that will help open the right dialogue between people regarding sustainability. So now we will briefly cover four of these key terms with you all. Um, one, diffuse accountability. Two, environmental push three, environmental pull, and four, circular economy. So one of the key challenges of sustainability is diffuse accountability. This refers to the fact that responsibility for sustainable development is shared by people, businesses, and governments. And because of this, people think that their wasteful acts won't have any impact. However, when everybody thinks with this mindset, the problem exponentially worsens. Instead of hoping that someone else takes responsibility, we need collective action and cooperation to create sustainable solutions. And we can't let the system fail because people refuse to be fully accountable. Now, in order to create, or in order to take collective action, we need to broaden our perspective and really understand what happens to the products we purchase and dispose of. And this is where environmental push and environmental pull come into play. So environmental push comes from the need to throw something out. Only biodegradable things fully return to nature, and the rest just gets moved to a new location. Once you throw it out, it becomes a problem for the place that you have thrown it out. For example, once a single-use plastic item has been used, it will end up in the landfill. And the push of the waste is the impact that it has on the landfill and on the land after it has been disposed of. And unfortunately, it will remain in the landfill for hundreds of years. And in addition to environmental pull, uh, push, we also have uh, another term, 
we define called environmental pull. And this is a slightly different concept. It's all about looking at the amount of resources needed to have a product exist in the place that it is. So let's, for example, let's take a plastic water bottle. You may only think that it has little to no impact because it's only one plastic water bottle that you move from the store to your home. However, environmental pull allows you to understand that it isn't just about that single water bottle, but first the resources that went into manufacturing the water bottle or like the plastic for the bottle, the filling up of the water bottle, the gas required to transport that bottle from a factory to a distribution, distribution center, and the additional gas required to transport the bottle from the, di from the distribution center to a store that you bought it from. And after you drink the water, the bottle gets disposed of, and if it's not recycled, it has severe environmental push, like Chronic just explained. Something so seemingly small, like a single plastic water bottle, can have drastic ramifications. And this is why the notion of environmental pull is so critical. And finally, the circular economy is an economic system that aims to keep resources in use for as long as possible, reducing both waste and pollution. It involves designing products and processes that enable materials to be reused, recycled, and repurposed. And this would create a closed loop where nothing is wasted. So the goal is to create a sustainable and regenerative system that benefits both the environment and the economy. So in conclusion, sustainability is not a choice. It's a necessity in today's world. We have reached a critical point in our history where we must take responsibility for our actions and their impact on our environment. To learn more terms like these, as well as start building more sustainable habits, we sincerely hope you refer to our handbook, The Essential Guide to Understanding Sustainability. And by prioritizing sustainability, we can create a better world for ourselves and future generations. Now on the slide behind us, um, you can see a QR code. So for anybody online, you may take a screenshot of the QR code to access it at a later time. And for anybody in the room, the QR code will also be on the back table for you guys to take a look at. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And thank you for producing such an impressive publication. I hope the library has added to its collection. So finally, we're going to have Roger Wang from Rutgers. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Roger Wang. I'm an assistant professor at Rutgers University. Uh, so today, uh, thank you for having me to uh, talk about some uh, innovative solutions uh, to climate change. Before I start, can I just uh, uh, do a quick survey? Um, how many of you are using a smartphone? How many of you know AI? Have you heard AI? <laughs> At least chat GPT? <laughs> OK. Look, the younger, the more. OK. OK, now it's a serious one. How many of you know, um, think you know climate change? <laughs> and uh, sea level rise. OK. So if you heard about this, actually, New Jersey is facing a big crisis about uh, sea level rise and climate change. So well, what I want to show you today is uh, some you know, innovative solution. And uh, I try to use uh, AI to generate uh, some figure that can best describe what happening in my lab. So this is uh, one photo generated by AI. <laughs> and uh, what I'm trying to do is uh, we, we combine different uh, solutions and see what we can do for the uh, coastal flooding. So uh, for coastal flooding, uh, because the sea level rise and above that is also tidal changes. The tidal actually increase the frequency and the extent of the coastal flooding. So what we are doing, we are funded by the uh, Department of Transportation to install two cameras in Puerto Rico. Uh, you can see that uh, it's uh, on the beach. So we are looking at, uh, we are collecting data to see how we can better understand this problem. Before we do anything, we need to better understand the uh, flooding. So what do we do about this uh, data? So for example, this is the, some photos we collected online. Using these photos, we can match the, some key points like the 
houses like the trees with, with a map such that we can map uh, the extent of the flood um, using Google Map and other things. And then you can see that we can also roughly estimate how deep the water was at different places in this map. Um, like if you can see that some uh, part of the car is submerged, so we can use that to map um, yeah, to see how big that flood was. Um, other things, so when we were doing this analysis, one disaster were, happened in central Michigan. So one uh, earth dam collapsed um, and the local government have to evacuate more than 10,000 uh, families uh, from that area. And, uh, but the, 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 the collapse was so su sudden, uh, that was a big surprise to the local because nobody was, uh, expected, uh, uh, was expecting about that. And then uh, as a result, no much uh, data about this uh, event. Uh, happy, uh, fortunately, one local resident was uh, standing there using iPhone, uh, captured the whole video, the process. You can see different frames from these uh, photos. And uh, we, we, got, we contacted this uh, resident and see, our, uh, can you allow us to use this uh, data to do some analysis? He said, yes, of course. And then we, we, we think, okay, what can we do about this? It's just a very uh, blur and a move, moving, um, at a low quality videos. Uh, what we are doing, we think, okay, to do that, we need to extract data from here. So one thing we do is uh, using uh, some self-driving technology. So uh, if you see those uh, color lines there, this, uh, these are like uh, in self-driving technology, they are tracking uh, pedestrians uh, on the streets. So they, they're tracking objects. We are using same technology. We are tracking where is the earth, uh, the, the soil coming from and how quickly it moves. In this way, it's uh, probably the only data set for this event. And uh, a lot of companies uh, approach us, say, can, can we use this uh, to improve our engineering, to approve our, our design? And uh, also, um, uh, like FEMA is interested in this data set to see can we uh, uh, call responsibility because of this and uh, using this data to do more analysis. Okay, the, um, on top of that, we are also trying to think um, global, uh, large scale, like uh, can, can we do something more interesting? So one thing we, we are, uh, we, we do data mining uh, from uh, social media, it's uh, Twitter here. So what we do is we, uh, people love to tweet about uh, special things and the floods that um, happen to be one of the topic. So we are using AI to extract the data from the uh, uh, social media. This is a, uh, um, for the, this is uh, one event in uh, Houston, um, Hurricane Harvey. We got about seven million tweets about floods. And then we filter that and we find that mostly valuable data from there. And these are some sample photos. Um, these photos could be valuable because uh, they, if you uh, can read from this uh, uh, screen, you can see that uh, some are talking about a very specific location about the floods. And uh, some even talk about special issues like the animals uh, trapped there. And these uh, data set could be very valuable to complement to the uh, FEMA's data, to the local government's data. So we think that uh, could be uh, valuable as a passive hotline for people to use. Um, also collectively, we think that, okay, if you look at the trend of this uh, uh, topic that people are talking about, like uh, if you look at orange line, that's uh, people are talking about the preparedness. Um, that's, uh, uh, that trend actually uh, uh, reached the top um, before the hurricane landfall. And during the hu uh, hurricane landfall, you can see that people more talk about, uh, about the impact of this hurricane. Uh, and later on, if you look at the green line and the red line, People are talking about, uh, that's uh, three days after the landfall, people start to talk about the, prepare, the, the re recovery and response from this hurricane. So we think that these curves could be useful because uh, uh, for the local government, they, they, they can be informed like uh, at this moment, what's the priority for the community to, uh, to do the action, whether we need, still need to prepare that or now is the time to recover from the hurricane. 
Uh, at last, we also design mobile phones. Uh, uh, I will show you the link uh, later. And uh, we encourage everyone to contribute data to our data set. Um, that will be very helpful for our research. On the other hand, we are talking about the solution to climate change. After understanding that, we, we want to do something to mitigate um, the uh, climate change. One thing I think uh, New Jersey is doing a great job is to developing offshore wind farms. Uh, these wind farms, uh, when they, if you see the map, when they, if you visit like Atlantic City or South Jersey, probably um, from uh, two years from now, maybe you can see th those huge wind turbines will be, uh, will be appeared, um, will appear uh, over the, uh, offshore. And if you look at uh, the um, data, uh, New Jersey is uh, targeted to um, have half of the energy from uh, renewable energy um, by 2050. So um, our New Jerseyans are doing a very great job and we are uh, making an ambitious target and uh, I think uh, we, we are going th that way. And these uh, wind turbines now are amazing. If you look at the size of that, uh, these are just comparable with, uh, compared with some huge buildings. If you see that uh, uh, the Statue of the Liberty is on the left-hand side and uh, also the London Eyes. Now the wind turbines we are going to build is much larger than those, um, those uh, great buildings already. And if you look at the, how much the area that the wind turbine split, swing, we call it the sweeping area. This area is as large as a football field now. So you can see how huge this is, um, this, these turbines. And uh, in the phase one, New Jersey is trying to build 99 of these big wind turbines uh, of uh, Atlantic City. And uh, this is another photo from GE. You can see that the hub of this uh, turbine compared to the walkers in the field. So you can see how huge these uh, uh, machines could be. And there's also a lot of job opportunities and a lot of new economy coming with this uh, new development. And uh, in my lab, we are funded by New Jersey Sea Grant to look at an uh, environmental problem. So when we build such a big turbines, will they give us some environmental impact? So one uh, concern here is the, a fish called the summer flounder. So because these flounders are very sensitive and very important for our economy, it, they, the commercial fishermen are interested in this and the recreational uh, fishermen are in, uh, interested in this. So please uh, tune, we just got funded uh, in this project. So in the future, hopefully we can update about you what we found whether the wind turbines will make an impact to this uh, fish. Our lab is also doing other things like, uh, for example, how much the 5G will make an impact on the weather forecasting and how we can better use satellites to help us understand the climate change, sea level rise, and coastal flooding issues. And at last, um, here is the link and uh, the QR code. If you're interested, please scan this and also download this app. Uh, then you can contribute data to our database. Uh, we are happy that uh, uh, everyone can be a scientist. Uh, this is a citizen science project. We, we love everyone to join us to collect more data and help us to address the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you, you've heard from an incredible array of experts on the topic. So now it's your chance to ask them questions. We've handed out cards. Um, you can fill out the card and they will be picked up and brought up front. So please share your questions. We're also going to have questions um, from our online viewers. But while we're waiting for your questions, I have some in advance. So we're going to start with our question for the mayor from May. She asks, when will Edgeboro Landfill give another tour for our community? Maybe Carol wants to answer that as well, <laughs> the two of you. <laughs> yeah, that, there was a couple of complaints um, before COVID about one of the systems that would failed up at the 
Edgeboro, and the odor was terrible. And because of that, they wanted to make an effort to get out into the community um, since the landfill is run by the MCUA, Middlesex County Utility Authority. And they wanted to get out into the public to try to explain the processes that they were putting in place to remediate the problem and going forward, uh, explain to people how the system work. It's incredibly complicated and I, frankly, if you're a scientist, it's quite fascinating. And at the time, uh, they did limited number of tours to people who were questioning how the operation works uh, to go up there. Uh, they really don't do that on a regular basis. We've asked them to do that again, and I think uh, that um, they're getting now to the point where all of that's remediated, and they might open that up again. So we'll have to re-investigate uh, the opportunities for those that are interested to get a tour. So hopefully you'll be hopefully more so. interested in going on a tour after this event. So here's one for Rich. So you told us a little bit about what your church is doing to become a green church. How is Trinity different from other green churches? What makes you so special? I, I don't think we are special. I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, we're, we're following our own path. I don't have, um, I think we're further along um, than a lot of other churches. I think we started the journey a little bit sooner uh, than most. So when I go to interfaith boards, and I, and, I, and I haven't done this recently, but, and I hear about what other churches are doing, I said, yeah, we, I mean, in terms of primarily looking for ideas and looking for different things that we can do, I find a lot of things that we've already done, and I, I find myself contributing more than getting, which is fine. I mean, so I just think that maybe just what makes us special, or if anything, is just that we started a little bit sooner than most. Uh, we have been recognized for our work by the, you know, the, um, by both our denomination. Uh, we were one of the first churches to be recognized uh, nationally by the Presbyterian Church USA. Um, and the first church, I believe, in our presbytery to be so recognized. And then the, uh, we've also been recognized by Green Faith. There's a recognition they no longer hand out because they've gone in a different direction. But we've also been recognized by them. <laughs> You know, for the work that we've done on, you know, helping get our own house in order, if you will. So we have one more related question for you, Rich, and that's how did church members accept the changes? Uh, there was some reluctance at first, especially when it came time to using the dishes and having to wash the dishes. And so <laughs> we have a dishwasher, we have a commercial dishwasher in the building which we rehabilitated as part of this project. Uh, but I think that, so there was that bit of reluctance. I think that's probably the, been the one area that we've seen the most reluctance uh, in terms of actually, uh, you know, for the, the work that we've done. But people signed on for paying the bills in terms of, you know, the energy savings projects that we did and doing along those lines, they, they signed on to that pretty quickly with little resistance. So we have more landfill questions. <laughs> There's a lot of interest in the landfill. Does the landfill have methane gas capture system? Uh, the, the landfill does have a methane gas capture system, and it's uh, processed, and actually they, they sell that. So it's one of the ways that they monetize the, the utility authority. So absolutely, it, it, isn't, it is not going to waste. So, Carol, you want to add to that? No, um, I, I just wanted to say I don't actually work for the Utilities Authority. I work for the county proper. So, you know, I, I know the answer to that question as well because we, <laughs> I've taken a tour of the facility uh, many, many times. Um, but if, if we get to too many tech, if we get to a really technical question, I'll, I'll have to try and take that back to my colleagues at the Utilities Authority. So, here's a question for you. Okay. Carol. <laughs> How can and where can we donate food? Yeah, so um, Middlesex County has uh, its own food pantry. It's located in East Brunswick off of Kennedy Boulevard. Um, it's called Replenish. So if you go to the Middlesex County website, which is www.middlesexcountynj.gov, uh, search for Replenish, and they have their own website. They host uh, food drives in various places. They would love uh, volunteer help. 
Um, they're also uh, starting a volunteer program to help us get the um, Get Food Smart message out to teach residents how to reduce and reuse their food. So if you're at all interested, uh, those folks over there are wonderful. Um, they're, they're really great to work with. So we're going to switch over to schools because we have more recyclable questions, but I think we should hit, hit up the schools first, so for the Patel twins. Staten Island's landfill is capped with beautiful grass covering it. Isn't that good that everything in it will decompose? Or will it? Um, well, landfills, once they're capped, they will be covered with like vegetation. However, the issue with that um, is that the things that are thrown inside of the landfill take um, many years to decompose and depending on the material it can take hundreds of years to decompose. Only biodegradable materials actually decompose very fast into the natural world so um, although it may, it's, it's like one of those things that may look good from the outside but on the inside there's a lot of stuff happening that's actually damaging to the environment so it still should be a concern and we should still prioritize um, reducing the amount of waste that enters the landfill. So what you see on the top doesn't necessarily reflect what's right. underneath. Mm -hmm. right. So for Matt, <laughs> why are the schools not using washable, reusable dishes and utensils, do you think? Why do I think, personally? Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> um, well. Personally, to be honest, I don't have that kind of... I'm not privy to that kind of information. Um, what I can say is that the schools have been, um, especially um, the East Brunswick schools, have been doing a lot of policies to mitigate um, the waste in general. Um, from what I've seen in particular, there's been a lot of use of paper straws. Um, there's been the removal of that plastic wrapping that comes around utensils. Um, and then, as I said earlier, with the fiber lunch trays being completely biodegradable. Um, I believe in the Churchill Junior High School, they use new dishwashers that use less water. I don't work in that building though, so I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, but there's a lot of other areas that they've been improving on in regards to phasing out plastics and becoming more reusable. So, Professor Wang. Okay. <laughs> um, the question for you is, are there other um, not wind sources of alternative energy being used in New Jersey that we should be aware of. Oh, thank you for the question. Yeah, so uh, I think uh, as shown in the in the graph, actually we also have a solar panel. You know that some of uh, I, I just have a friend who installed a new solar panel on his roof. So I think uh, solar panel definitely another part of this uh, renewable energy. Um, and you see that the very small piece of that is the biofuel. Um, even though um, that uh, technology is still um, relatively more expensive, so, but I still think that's a good um, uh, complementary uh, energy source in the future. Thank you. So I don't know who this is for, but one to open it up. Uh, can we require new homes to have solar panels? The state of New Jersey actually has a requirement now that um, states that uh, all not homes, but industrial buildings and manufacturing buildings have to, new ones that are built have to have 40% of the roof uh, available and ready for solar panels. So the state is actually uh, responding. It's actually now part of our uh, planning and zoning requirements here in the township. Uh, so we, we adhere to that. Uh, but they don't have that right now for, uh, for single family homes. I think the state's desperately looking to work on a system that improves the incentives for people to put solar panels. It was very much a program that did favor it based on your return on investment, how long you intended to live in your home, uh, that you could write that cost over a long period of time. But the s regs, the amount of money that you got back for energy that you sold back to the grid has gone down. So the ROI, the return on investment now is longer. Uh, and the state is desperately looking to put together a program uh, that goes back to incentivizing people in a meaningful way to be able to uh, put them on their homes. 
How about these new apartment complexes going up, say, right beyond Route 18? Those apartment complexes were um, approved several years ago. Anything new will have much stricter requirements than they did at that time. And there's still more building that's required of old communities throughout the state of New Jersey over the next couple of years. So I think that the regulations will ramp up as more and more uh, building continues, which we're obligated to provide under an obligation for affordable housing, which we all know we need in New Jersey. Yeah, yeah, and probably here in East Brunswick, yeah. Okay, so let's see what else. Yes, bring me more questions. So more on recyclables. Where are our recyclables taken and sorted? What percentage isn't sorted? So in Middlesex County, we don't have a Middlesex County run recycling facility. So our recyclables go to a number of different private facilities. Um, there is a uh, large facility in New Brunswick um, that a lot of our recyclables go to. There's another facility in Woodbridge that are, a lot of the recyclables go to. Um, and another one in Newark. So that's uh, where predominantly our, our recyclables go to, so private sorting uh, facilities. Um, and as far as the, we call it a residue rate, it depends. Some towns' residue rates are a lot lower than other towns. Um, it can go as low as 5% if you're a really good town and you got a great handle and, and your residents know exactly what to recycle and are, are recycling the proper things. It can go in the opposite direction, you know, upwards 15, 20% of, of materials that are ending up in, in, in the recycling stream that aren't able to get recycled. And you know that ends up having to be disposed of. So it varies. We're doing better than we were about four years ago. Uh, but there's still room for improvement. So here's another one for Roger. How are the flood-related tweets used in your research to inform upcoming floods? Oh, thank you for the question. Yeah, um, uh, I think uh, there are two major use of our uh, tweets so far. So one thing is that uh, we can directly use the, the the flood-related tweets to inform the local government and the emergency response team how we can better rescue and how we can better prepare and recover from the um, floods. On the other hand, uh, we are also building models. Those models actually uh, uh, have uh, the capability to predict the future floods. They can uh, early warn people about the floods. So um, these data models need uh, um, data to be validated. So if we don't validate the model, it's just rubbish in, rubbish out. So um, the, after validation, the model could be useful, have the capability to make a prediction. So thank you. So a question, maybe it's yours as well. Are the wind turbines contributing to the deaths of whales and dolphins? <laughs> That's a tough one. So for those who don't know me, my name is Liti Haramati. I'm a researcher at the Department of Marine and Coastal Sciences at Rutgers. And uh, we hosted a few weeks ago a Rutgers PhD student who's studying whale populations of the shore of New Jersey and New York. Uh -huh. And anyone interested, you can, uh, you can see this um, webinar. Uh, it's posted on EBTV. Uh, website or YouTube channel. And I, I'll just say one thing. There's been a, what they call an unusual mortality event of whales and other, and other marine mammals that started, started in 2016, I believe. And actually, she, since they started the, the wind turbines uh, surveys, there are fewer whale and marine mammal deaths. they just more in the news um, because and I will say, because of people who are op opposing the building of marine turbines off the shore of New Jersey. Um, there's studies being done all the time. It's being followed. The survey boats are, are using sonars. Sonars are not good for marine mammals, but the sonars used by those survey boats are very weak and are used for a very short time. 
Every boat on the surveys has a marine biologist looking for whales during the day, and if they're working out at night when it's dark, there's two marine biologists on every boat. So, so far, the data and the scientists don't think there's a connection between building the wind turbines and death of whales. And as Dr. Wang mentioned, uh, there's a lot of funding that go into actually researching the marine environment where these turbines are going to build and the effect on fish and currents and a lot of other things. Anyone interested, contact me. I'll, I'll give you links. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so you. I was, I, I attended a panel recently on the history of the Port Authority and apparently our port is now become the number one port in the country again. So the volume of activity um, during COVID with all the shipping increased, but they couldn't handle it on the West Coast, and a lot of it's coming to the East Coast. So the volume of what's going on in our port is increasing. So some believe that's part of the reason why there's a lot more ships out there, so they're hitting these animals when they're at sea. So it was just, I think, in the paper today, they're trying to slow down ships and take other precautions because it's very dangerous out there, especially at night, I guess. So anyway, my two cents. So um, we have more on recyclables. Um, we already heard a little bit about how, did we hear really about how they're sorted? I guess so. Um, where does it all go? We heard that. Um, but how can we help to do recycling better and then a PS on that. My husband and I sort and wrap our, cycles care, our recycles carefully, but then we see it picked up and all thrown on the truck together. What happens to it? Where does it go? So sort of the same two, two sets of questions, but more for you, Carol. Okay, um, let, a point of clarification on the question. Are the recyclables being mixed with garbage? Because if you do see that happening, that is not um, allowable. Um, if you do live in, I know we, we occasionally get phone calls in the office um, that a hauler is coming with one truck and picking up both the recycling dumpster and the garbage dumpster. If you see that happening, feel free to give our office a call and we'll follow up with the hauler. Um, you know, occasionally we get new drivers who aren't quite sure what they, sh what they are supposed to be doing and, and we, we do have uh, mix-ups that happen and we do want to try and correct those as, as quickly as possible. Um, but in New Jersey, most of our recyclables are collected single stream. So if you're going to sort out your paper from your cans and bottles, I would not be surprised if it all gets combined into the one, into the one vehicle. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we have a number of different private sorting uh, facilities in the county. They do separate it all out. The paper gets separated from your glass, gets separated from your different types of plastic. Um, and where does it go? It depends. Much more of our plastic um, is processed domestically. Um, the uh, Association, I think it's of Plastic Re Recyclers, um, estimates about 92% of the plastic that's re recycled is recycled in North America, meaning uh, Canada, Mexico, and, and the United States. So that's a lot higher percentage than it used to be. Uh, we are also uh, hearing about more paper mills being located in the United States as well. So uh, one of the, I guess the one silver lining of, of all this market crisis we had a few years ago is the, is the recyclers uh, realize that we need more domestic markets and that's, uh, you know, we need a mix of domestic markets and overseas markets so that we don't get caught up and, and have a, whole, a hard time again. So more and more is being handled domestically and being made into new products domestically. So one more question for you about replenish mm -hmm. sites around the county because it costs money and gas to get to sites. Will there be more sites? And maybe at Turkey? Yeah, so Re Replenish, <laughs> Replenish has a great network of local food banks. Um, and I'm only kind of just getting into what they do, so I'm not the, the really knowledgeable person about what, what they do. But I know they have a network of, of food banks. So they're working with uh, you know more than one site in each town. Oh, do we have somebody who can actually answer the question better than me? Thank you. <laughs> I will take I will take the assist. <laughs> Great. 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 Of course, 
right here in East Brunswick, we have a food pantry. Um, it's right actually across the street from here. It's called Aldersgate Outreach Community Center. It is also a thrift store. So you can donate all small household items that are in usable condition that are not either damaged or broken or missing pieces. Everything that's done at the thrift store is done by volunteers. All the money raised at the thrift store supports the food bank, and that food bank feeds people once a week, which is unusual. They also have a truck from Elijah's Promise that comes there once a week and brings hot meals. So that's located right across the street. They're there Tuesday, Friday, and Sunday, and they take food and any non-perishable food. There is a food bank in Milltown. There is a food bank in South River. Replenish supports all of these smaller food banks, so you can make donations to Replenish where they will distribute evenly based on need, or you can donate directly to a food bank in your town. So I, I know there's one on Main Street, Cups for uh, down there, not Main Street, um, down by south of us. There's one on that Main Street, but they are in each town and you can Google it and you'll find them. But for East Brunswick, it is directly across the street. There's a big move now that we are too wrapped up in what the, re re the um, expiration date is on canned goods, that that really is not a cut and dry. The can can still be good, even though the expiration date on it might be passed. Um, so she asked if the food pantry takes those. They will take them if they're just slightly past. They will not take them much past, and that's just because of the liability. There is more of a chance of that food being spoiled once it gets past that expiration date, and it gives an increased liability to the food bank. So for that reason, they try not to do anything that's past. If it's slightly past, they sometimes have like a, a, a take your own bin kind of thing, I would guess, so people could know and take it like kind of at your own risk, I guess you would kind of describe it. But for the most most part, no. They don't want it to be past the expiration date. So a question about plastics. Is there um, any exploration of alternative bio biodegradable material for plastic bottles going on in this area? I don't know if anybody is aware of this. I, I do want to make the comment. So when you're talking about biodegradable, biodegradable where? Um, you know, are you, if, you're, if it's biodegradable and somebody litters it, well, okay, and, and what does that mean? Is it going to turn into microplastics or is it truly biodegradable? If it's the biodegradable, and you'll sometimes see um, items sold as, as compostable, biodegradable, but that's only if, if it's uh, taken to an, an industrial type composting facility which our material is not taken to. So there, there is a lot of research. There's a lot going on. Um, do I think biodegradable plastics will, will have um, some role later on? No, no. Or bio, That's my opinion, though. Biodegradable so. containers. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's an yeah. opinion. <laughs> so what kind of research is Rutgers doing in this area? Do you know, Roger? Yeah, my colleague actually is uh, having a project to uh, do a survey. Now we just try to understand how big the problem is the microplastic and uh, what's the distribution of the plastic on the beach of New Jersey. And uh, we are also applying for grants to see whether we can build some trappers to help uh, stabilize and help to extract the microplastic from the environment. Hopefully one day we got funded and uh, work on the innovation. This. Yeah, we had a speaker last year who showed us, Nicole, I don't know if it was yeah. right, it was pretty overwhelming <coughs> to see just how much is on uh, washing up. So what kind of plans are there to collaborate more with big corporations in this area um, from East Brunswick? Well, interestingly enough, um, uh, I, I have to give a lot of credit to our present governor who's made a huge effort, more than almost any that I could remember in the past, at trying to initiate programs that are private and public uh, partnerships. Uh, one such example, and that's not just for East Brunswick, it's for the state, uh, is a, as we all know, there's a lot of um, industrial and manufacturing space that have these massive roofs that are totally um, opportunities to provide uh, solar energy. So the state of New Jersey has actually uh, come up with a program that will pay for the solar roofs on those ceilings so that the owners of those properties get the solar roof for free. 
However, uh, which significantly reduces their energy cost, uh, but any of the energy savings that would ordinarily go back to the grid uh, that they would get back later, that has to be donated uh, to be used for energy for people who qualify from low income. So oh, it is wow. actually a, a, a wow. unique problem, a, a unique solution yeah. to providing incentives to businesses to do something that's not only good for themselves, but at the same time helping those that are the neediest among us. So those are examples, and there's a many others. Um, but these things are, are taking fold right now, and I think will um, are great examples of how the government is looking to partner with private industry to try to solve solutions in more unique ways. And how capable is the grid for accepting all this additional solar input from various sites, do you know? Well, the, the grid would be um, local, so it would have to go back to people in your own community. But is the grid capable yes. of accepting all that dis diffused energy sources? Right now, I think we're in a good place. If, if every business in the world took advantage of it tomorrow, I don't know if we'd be there. So I think the grid needs to grow as the, as the um, number of participants grow. We have some uh, questions that have come in through the chat, and this one I think would be for Professor Chang. It's interesting. Has anyone looked into outer space trash and whether it has an effect on climate change and the environment? I guess talking about things like satellites that are dead and circulating around the Earth? Yeah, I think at Rutgers we have a faculty called uh, uh, Xiao Li Bai, uh, she is working on the uh, space trash. It's uh, actually uh, scientists are tracking these the things and uh, they are concerned about these things. Uh, but I am not aware how could they use that to address climate change. I think that could be a cool idea if someone developed that. Another question, uh, what's the remain, this is for, um, for Carol, <laughs> what is the remaining lifespan of the Edgeboro landfill and what happens when it's full? So right now the uh, landfill is undergoing a permit a renewal process. Um, so uh, I can't say definitively because the permit renewal has, has not been uh, issued yet. But I believe the estimates are uh, the landfill life uh, will be extended till 2034. Mm -hmm. But as the mayor pointed out, um, that's, you know, that's subject to change. That's subject to what can we do um, to remove waste from the landfill to extend the life of the landfill. Um, as far as what happens um, once the, the landfill uh, life is, is over, um, you know, that's, that's a, a ways away from now, so I, I could not uh, begin to try and answer that. There could be new technologies um, that, that happen before uh, the landfill life is over. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm, I don't even want to try and answer that question. What can the town and or the county do to reduce use of single-use plastics by businesses without requiring a state law to, um, to do that, such as banning plastic straws uh, and plastic cutlery or non-recyclable or, or reusable containers, non-reusable containers? Well, I believe in a free market, so I think that if uh, people that, uh, that are consumers uh, end up not using companies or supporting companies that aren't doing the right thing for the environment, um, money talks. And I think that they will be uh, forced without regulation to do the right thing. So I think that uh, it's really all in your hands. Uh, how can we reduce food waste? Can the county or the township start a composting program? Maybe this is better on the township level. Uh, that households could contribute compost compostable uh, foods, food waste and then be able to get compost for their gardens from you know, different locations. Is that something in the works? Is it happening anywhere? Our director of, of public works uh, happens to be a composter himself and a big believer in the idea of composting. So it is something that we want to start educating the public about uh, and ease ourselves into it. But I do believe that it's the uh, intention of the township to try to move to um, education first and, and then uh, make that opportunity available to as many people as possible, because that really is fitting in with exactly what we're talking about here, which is to reduce unnecessary waste. We have one last question, and we don't have that much more time, but I thought 
this should be a conversation among all of us and maybe you. What do you think should be a priority for our town as far as sustainability? I think for in terms of sustainability and in terms of town, I think change can best start in um, youngsters and in schools first. So I think we should definitely uh, try to do as much as we can in terms of changing schools and changing like processes we do in schools. Like for example, um, we can teach students more or like we can create an awareness for students early on on uh, building sustainable habits and if they if students are able to garner that kind of awareness at a younger age they can uh, develop those type of habits at a younger age and that'll probably increase the chance that they continue to carry out those habits as they grow up and mature in effect maybe their parents as well take, yeah take home those ideas to their families others um. Yeah, I agree with the Patels on this. Um, it's funny because it, as a first year teacher, I feel very fortunate in the fact that I get to build my curriculum from the ground up, from the foundation. And what I've been trying to do, and I'm going to continue this into my career, is um, incorporating uh, current events and policies that are continually being uh, passed through and from what I've seen with the high school and the school system, they've been doing an excellent job with the food waste management. Um, I think maybe the next step would be to um, address the plastics. I see a lot of students still carrying around plastic water bottles, and even I tell my students this to just ditch it, just invest in a water thermos. You don't have to worry about microplastics or recycling them, just something that's easily reusable, something better than recycling. Great, and Roger, what about? From yeah, your I think, perspective. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, that's a very important question, and uh, I think education will be the priority for our town. Um, uh, if you have a chance, please uh, feel free to come to Rutgers, and my lab will welcome to, want you to look at the new solutions and the new things. And also, before I finish, uh, be aware that there's another um, event called Rutgers Day. which On will Saturday. Be, uh, yes, yes. That's Saturday. It's coming up. Yeah, please, that would be a great event. Thank and you. hopefully we can learn more. So let's see, Rich, what's your perspective? I, I, I think that just as we did as a church, I think that to start at home, right? I think that's the biggest thing you do to affect your own change. I mean, if you have any remaining incandescent light bulbs, replace them. And there are simple things that you can do in terms of you know, following the mantra, of reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Reduce your consumption. Reuse what you don't no longer have use for. You know, find another purpose for it, uh, and then recycle what's remaining, so that we can try and get to this thing where we have a sustainable lifestyle, where the planet is capable of renewing itself. It's just that we are consuming a whole lot more than the planet is renewing, and that's what we have to really get to. I mean, at the end of the day, is really the the, the, the sum of the whole, of the whole matter. So. And that all starts at home. I mean, start with your own behaviors. I mean, that, that, that's where I would. So Carol, what are we gonna do with all those light bulbs that we're <laughs> gonna get rid of? Yeah, it depends on the light bulbs. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna echo uh, the, the comments that the others have made. Um, you know, not only start at home, but start with one thing. Um, so many times we go out and we talk to people and we give them this list of ideas of all the things they can do. And, and you see people like the deer in the headlights look of people being overwhelmed. And, and we end up with saying, pick, pick one thing. Pick one thing that you can do. Um, and, and it starts you know, with that one thing. And then maybe next week, you try something else. And instead, so you're not so overwhelmed. You're seeing that little changes are going to add up to a lot. And so last but not least, our mayor. <laughs> We're humans, and we like to conform. And uh, I think that uh, we just simply need to change what the norms are. And like the student said, I believe it starts, it starts with our youth. I remember my kids came home from school in elementary, they're long done with school, uh, but they came home with elementary school with all the guidelines and rules that we needed to do to make sure that the house was fire retardant. And, we had, and I, they made me do drills in the house and to know how everybody would get out and to make sure that plugs were anywhere near uh, where, where uh, um, 
papers and magazines and things that I hadn't really thought about. When they started to learn to drive, they became an expert after the fact that I've been driven for 25 years. Now they were like better experts than me, telling me everything that I was doing wrong. Um, so the kids tend to drive a lot of behavior. And so I think if we can get our youth onto the right behaviors, the rest, of the, uh, the rest of their friends will follow. When more people are doing the right thing, the rest will follow. And when more of our youth are doing it, the parents will tend to follow. So I think that we're, we're just, we're getting close to it. Um, but I think it starts with the youth, and that's why I congratulate you guys for putting the book together. Thank I think you. I was one of the first people to read it. Thank you, and Catherine, for helping them and, and, and mentoring them through it. Um, but it's a community effort, and, uh, and it starts here. So I want to thank the panel for being great colleagues and talking about this. And I'm going to turn it over to Chris, and you can award people. You were very, very informative, and we appreciate so much your cooperation in joining us. And now we come to the fun part of the program. We have our uh, science teacher, eighth grade Churchill teacher, Melissa Novak, and she will present the awards for the Student Salvage Art Contest. Melissa. All right. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. As Chris said, my name is Melissa Novak. I um, teach eighth grade at Churchill Junior High School, which is an odd thing for me to say because I taught for 15 years sixth grade science um, at Hammerschold. So, um, just one comment to the last question that was asked. Uh, the state of New Jersey has standards for teaching and learning, and I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware that climate change is such at the forefront of the New Jersey Department of Education's mind that there are climate change standards at every single grade level in every single content area. In physical education classes, there are climate change standards. So it's not just up to the science teacher, to the civics teachers, to the humanities teachers to um, educate and inform our students. The state of New Jersey, like I said, has put this at such a high priority that they have made this the duty and responsibility of every single teacher at every single grade level. So I just think that shows you that we're super fortunate to live in a state that really prioritizes the education um, of, of its citizens on this topic. So I just wanted to start with saying that. Um, the second thing, the real reason that I'm standing up here is because we hosted our second art contest. And as a committee, we decided, you know, last time we did posters, you know, we're going big or going home. So we did um, sculptures this year. Um, we did have a lot of really good submissions. We do have two of our student winners here today, so we did want to call them up. They are also going to present their um, sculptures, works of art to you. When we were coming up with the theme for the contest, as many of you know, East Brunswick is nationally known for our work with butterflies in the Butterfly Garden. We're also nationally recognized for the salamander crossings at Beekman Road. So we thought a really good way to pay um, homage to the work that's been done in the past in East Brunswick was to have students create sculptures out of found, salvaged, recyclable, like nothing brand new, stuff that you intended to throw away. Let's take all that stuff and make something really beautiful. So we do, like I said, have two of our student winners. Um, first, we have Samantha Viela Sierra. She made a beautiful sculpture, come on, bring it up, honey, of a salamander. She did a really good job, so you can show everybody her salamander that she made of, like I said, stuff that she intended to throw in the trash, right? She turned into this um, really, really beautiful sculpture of a salamander. Um, we also have Melissa Verano, who made a really beautiful sculpture. As soon as you see it, you're gonna say, ooh, I know what her salvaged materials were. She repurposed a toilet paper roll into a little tree with a bunch of butterflies on it. Um, so she did a really nice job. We're really proud of our students and the initiative they took to share their artistic talents and also kind of make a statement with their art for how important this is to our community. Um, even though they're not here, we did have one entry from East Brunswick High School. Um, the winner of that first place was Emma Cosgrove. Um, and we had two other entries from um, Churchill Junior High School. Um, they're twins, actually. That's like our theme here, I guess. Um, 
in the Environmental Sustainability Task Force, but um, Zoe Kwan and Nicole Kwan, they each made a sculpture, one of a butterfly and one of a salamander. Beautiful, beautiful work. And we do real quickly want to just thank our sponsors. Um, Sandy's Pizza, always a great friend to all co um, community organizations in East Brunswick. Um, Four Boys Pizza, uh, Ice Cream, and um, Crystal Springs. They have provided prizes for our student winners, so we just really wanted to thank them for their support of the, co the endeavors of the community. So there's our student winners, really good job. So proud of you guys. We also want to honor two of our newest members to the Sustainability Task Force. Uh, they are also serving on the Youth Council and they have worked very hard on a fundraiser. The fundraiser was a pickleball court tournament and they raised all this money and gave it to us, the East Brunswick Sustainability Task Force. And they are twins. Uh, I don't know if they're here tonight, if they were able to be here tonight, but those students are Dasha Patel and Kia Sheath, and they have been awarded uh, nice prizes from the Youth Council. And we really want to um, show our appreciation for the Youth Council as well. So can I just hear a round of applause for these students? Let's make some noise. Okay, thank you very much. And now Holly Cerami is here to say a few words about the East Brunswick S uh, Sustainability Task Force new initiative. Thank you. So we've been discussing a lot of issues today, but the task force has been focusing on eliminating single-use plastic bottles in our town. That has been our initiative. It is not done. There's a long way to go but we decided that we were at the point where we could take on another initiative. So we are looking at something that's been mentioned a few times in this panel, the amount of waste that is included in a bag of takeout food. I would assume that most of you, just like me, when you get takeout food and bring it home, would prefer to use your own silverware over that very flimsy, breakable plastic that they give you. And we'd also prefer to use your own bottle of ketchup rather than standing and ripping open 16 little bottles, things of ketchup, and still not having enough for your french fries. But yet, those things are given to us. Duck sauce, ketchup, napkins, true. All of that is put into these bags without thought, and it comes home, and we throw them out without thought. And one, it's plastic, two, the landfill. The landfill will last as long as the landfill is not full. I mean, don't be misled by the year, because the year is not what determines it. The full landfill is what determines it. If there's room in the landfill, it could get extended to 2050. It has nothing to do with time, it has to do with space. So the less we put there, the longer it lasts. And, and this is something that all of us are guilty of throwing out, because what else can you do with it? So our initiative is we are going to go to the restaurants, and we are going to try to educate them with the idea that the same way they say, are you paying with credit card, they should say, do you need silverware? Do you need napkins? Do you need disposable items? Because there are those few instances where maybe you're taking your food to the park and you are going to use those items, but they are few and far between. So for the, all those other times, the answer is no. So we're asking the public to help by telling them when you order. Say, I don't need any giveaways. I don't need any silverware. I don't need any napkins. I don't need any packets. I have been doing that, and I find that maybe 75% of the time, I get nothing, or 90% of the time, I get a lot less. So it's a two-way street. Our goal now is going to be to educate these restaurants, to incentivize them not to do it. It's a savings of money. It's a savings of trash. You know, and we, are, we are, have gotten a grant. We are going to give them stickers so that everybody will know which of these restaurants is cooperating and is working on this. So that is the next thing we are going to be working on. I hope you will all help by doing your part and asking the restaurants to participate in this initiative so that we can help reduce plastic and reduce waste. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Tonight, we have been made more aware of the changes that we all need to make. I'm going to ask you to do just three things. One, when you do your 
take out orders, just skip the things that you don't want and you're not going to use. Two, I would like you, when you're getting your bottled beverages, take a look at the little triangle that signifies recycle, recy uh, recyclability. If it has a one or a two, we can recycle it, and that's good. But if in that triangle you don't see any numbers, we can't recycle it in this town. Please be aware of that. And become, the third thing is become an advocate for change. Talk, talk to your neighbors, talk to your family. Remember, you're doing this for your children and your grandchildren. It will be the effort and change we start right now that will provide our future generations for a home they can live in and take care of. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Zoom audience, and thank all of you in here.